MIT and newly formed company launch novel approach to fusion power. An MIT engineering course became an incubator for fusion design innovations. The goal is for research to produce a working pilot plant within 15 years. Progress toward the long-sought dream of fusion power, potentially an inexhaustible and zero-carbon source of energy, could be about to take a dramatic leap forward. For decades researchers have explored fusion, the reaction that powers the sun, as a potential source of virtually endless, carbon-free energy on Earth. MIT has studied the process with a series of Alcay to Tokamaks, compact machines that use high magnetic fields to keep the hot plasma inside and away from the walls of a donut-shaped vacuum vessel long enough for fusion to occur. But understanding how plasma affects tokamak materials, and making the plasma dense and hot enough to sustain fusion reactions, has been elusive. Electricity generated by fusion power plants could play an important role in decarbonizing the U.S. energy sector by mid-century, says a new consensus study report from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, which also lays out for the first time a set of technical, economic, and regulatory standards and a timeline for a U.S. fusion pilot plant that would begin producing energy in the 2035-40 time frame. To achieve this key step toward commercialization, the report calls for an aggressive public-private effort to produce by 2028 a pilot plant design that can, when built, accommodate any of the developmental approaches seeking to realize fusion's potential as a safe, carbon-free, on-demand energy source. Those requirements include a total pilot plant cost of less than $5.6 billion and generating capacity of at least 50 megawatts. In addition to proving the ability to create reliable, sustained net energy gain and power production from fusion for steadily increasing periods of time, says the report, the plant must provide cost certainty to the marketplace in terms of capital cost, construction time, control of radioactive effluents including tritium, the cost of electricity, and the maintenance, operating schedule and cost. These results would inform subsequent construction of first-of-a-kind commercial fusion plants in the 2040s, and then broader propagation of fusion energy facilities onto the grid around mid-century, by which time major U.S. utilities have committed to deep reductions in their carbon emissions. A key near-term factor in achieving these goals is formation of multiple public-private teams to conceptualize and design aspects of the pilot plant over the next seven years. These include improved fusion confinement and control, materials that can withstand the withering temperatures and stresses produced during fusion, methods of extracting fusion-generated heat and harnessing it for generation and development of a closed fuel cycle. All are technically challenging and also require close attention to cost, manufacturability, maintainability, and other system-level considerations. Superconducting magnets are key. Fusion, the process that powers the sun and stars, involves light elements, such as hydrogen, smashing together to form heavier elements such as helium, releasing prodigious amounts of energy in the process. This process produces net energy only at extreme temperatures of hundreds of millions of degrees Celsius, too hot for any solid material to withstand. To get around that, fusion researchers use magnetic fields to hold in place the hot plasma, a kind of gaseous soup of subatomic particles, keeping it from coming into contact with any part of the donut-shaped chamber. The new effort aims to build a compact device capable of generating 100 million watts, or 100 megawatts, MW, of fusion power. This device will, if all goes according to plan, 
demonstrate key technical milestones needed to ultimately achieve a full-scale prototype of a fusion power plant that could set the world on a path to low-carbon energy. If widely disseminated, such fusion power plants could meet a substantial fraction of the world's growing energy needs while drastically curbing the greenhouse gas emissions that are causing global climate change. Fusion reactions occur when two or more atomic nuclei come close enough for long enough that the nuclear force pulling them together exceeds the electrostatic force pushing them apart, fusing them into heavier nuclei. For nuclei lighter than iron 56, the reaction is exothermic, releasing energy. For nuclei heavier than iron 56, the reaction is endothermic, requiring an external source of energy. 2. Hence, nuclei smaller than iron 56 are more likely to fuse while those heavier than iron 56 are more likely to break apart. The strong force acts only over short distances, while the repulsive electrostatic force acts over longer distances. In order to undergo fusion, the fuel atoms need to be given enough energy to approach each other close enough for the strong force to become active. The amount of kinetic energy needed to bring the fuel atoms close enough is known as the Coulomb barrier. Ways of providing this energy include speeding up atoms in a particle accelerator, or heating them to high temperatures. Once an atom is heated above its ionization energy, its electrons are stripped away, leaving just the bare nucleus. This process is known as ionization, and the resulting nucleus is known as the ion. The result is a hot cloud of ions and the electrons formally attached to them. This cloud is known as plasma. Because the charges are separated, plasmas are electrically conductive and magnetically controllable. Many fusion devices take advantage of this to control the particles as they are heated. Abundant Energy Fusing atoms together in a controlled way releases nearly 4 million times more energy than a chemical reaction such as the burning of coal, oil or gas and 4 times as much as nuclear fission reactions, at equal mass. Fusion has the potential to provide the kind of baseload energy needed to provide electricity to our cities and our industries. Sustainability Fusion fuels are widely available and nearly inexhaustible. Deuterium can be distilled from all forms of water, while tritium will be produced during the fusion reaction as fusion neutrons interact with lithium. Terrestrial reserves of lithium would permit the operation of fusion power plants for more than 1,000 years, while sea-based reserves of lithium would fulfill needs for millions of years. No go to. Fusion doesn't emit harmful toxins like carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Its major byproduct is helium, an inert, non toxic gas. No long lived radioactive waste. Nuclear fusion reactors produce no high activity, long lived nuclear waste. The activation of components in a fusion reactor is low enough for the materials to be recycled or reused within 100 years. Limited risk of proliferation. Fusion doesn't employ fissile materials like uranium and plutonium. Radioactive tritium is neither a fissile nor a fissionable material. There are no enriched materials in a fusion reactor like it or that could be exploited to make nuclear weapons. No risk of meltdown. A Fukushima type nuclear accident is not possible in a tokamak fusion device. It is difficult enough to reach and maintain the precise conditions necessary for fusion, if any disturbance occurs. The plasma cools within seconds and the reaction stops. The quantity of fuel present in the vessel at any one time is enough for a few seconds only and there is no risk of a chain reaction cost. The power output of the kind of fusion reactor that is envisaged for the second half of this century will be similar to that of a fission reactor, that is, between 1 and 1.7 gigawatts.
the average cost per kilowatt of electricity is also expected to be similar, slightly more expensive at the beginning, when the technology is new, and less expensive as economies of scale bring the costs down. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe to my channel.